For most of human history, humans have simply been at the mercy of illness, which we didn't well understand and which sometimes seemed to strike lords just as easily as it did peasants. Diseases from polio to the common cold were deadly and bedeviled humanity from the start, but many dread illnesses now have treatments, and some even have vaccines that can prevent you from getting the illness in the first place. And it might surprise you to find out that the basic idea of inoculation is not new, but has been practiced for at least many hundreds of years, even though it wasn't always readily understood or accepted by the medical community. The role of an African slave named Onesimus, who was owned by Cotton Mather, a famous Puritan minister of Boston at the turn of the 18th century, was critical in convincing American and European physicians that exposure to smallpox in small doses could create resistance to the illness without contracting it. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Smallpox is a devastating disease caused by the variola virus that occurred throughout human history, often in outbreaks that killed large numbers of people and caused significant disruption. The disease is characterized by a skin rash that turned into characteristic fluid-filled bumps with a depression in the center. It's highly contagious, and historically death rates were about 30%, and survivors often had extensive scarring or even blindness. It's speculated the disease has affected humans for at least 12,000 years. Some of the earliest evidence of the disease has been found in Egyptian mummies. It's been suggested as a possible cause of death for Pharaoh Ramses V, who died in 1145 BC. Hittite scrolls tell of a fatal and contagious disease that ravaged the empire, killing two of its rulers in the 14th century BC. A possible early description comes from the Hindu text, the Susrata Samhita, attributed to the physician Denwantari, which details a sickness that starts with a fever and then red, yellow, and white, and depressed in the center. The prevalence and danger of the disease even led a number of ancient religions to worship specifically smallpox-related deities, such as the Hindu de goddess Shitala, as well as multiple African deities. Variola, the name of the virus, derives from the Latin word for spotted or mottled, or from varus, meaning pimple, but the illness has gone by many names, such as the speckled monster or the red plague. The term smallpox originated in 16th century England to distinguish it from the great pox syphilis. Smallpox gradually became one of the greatest threats over the next few centuries. A later German proverb held, from love and smallpox, but few remain free. By the 1600s, smallpox was present in much of the world, including the New World, where it ravaged Native American populations. The first attempts to inoculate populations against the devastation of smallpox took place in China, India, the Middle East, and Africa, and might have been used as early as the turn of the millennia. Called variolation, the process involves exposing a person to a small dose of live smallpox to give them a minor case that nonetheless protects them from the virus. It is an imperfect solution, but death rates from variolation were only around 1%, which is far better than those offered by the actual illness. In China, they did this by grinding up the scabs of sufferers and giving it to them by nasal insufflation, blowing it into their nostrils. They would deliberately choose minor cases to use as donated material, hoping to ensure the inoculated patient's survival. Afterwards, they quarantined the patient as if they had contracted the disease naturally until it passed. Chinese physicians would use a silver pipe to administer the inoculation. They specifically used the right nostril for boys and the left nostril for girls. The other primary method involved taking material from the infected and introducing it directly into an open wound on a healthy patient. By 1700, variolation was present in Turkey, where the British would first encounter it. Lady Mary Wortley Montague had lost a brother to smallpox before she contracted the disease in December 1715. The disease was said to have marred her face and left her without eyebrows. In 1716, her husband was appointed ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, and Lady Montague accompanied him to the country. She was a prolific writer and wrote about much of her journey, including her famous 1717 letter to a friend. The smallpox, so fatal and so general amongst us, is here entirely harmless by the invention of ingrafting. She described the Turkish custom of women inserting smallpox into the veins of the uninfected to give them a mild form of smallpox. They have very rarely above 20 or 30 in their faces, with never mark, and in eight days they're as well as they were before the illness. Mary had her own son inoculated in Constantinople and brought the news back to England. English authorities had first heard of the method 20 years earlier when two reports were sent to the Royal Society, but no action had been taken. The Royal Society later published two reports on the practice in 1714 and 1716, which reached the prominent Boston minister, Cotton Mather. 
he wrote to a member of the Royal Society that he had read the papers, but that their content wasn't new to him. He had already heard of variolation. In 1706, a slave was presented to Mather by his parishioners. We don't know what his birth name was, but Mather gave him the English name Onesimus, after a slave mentioned in the epistle of Philemon. Mather wrote that many months before I met with any imitations of treating ye smallpox with ye method of inoculation, and were in Europe, I had from a servant of my own an account of it being practiced in Africa. Mather says that when asked if he had ever had smallpox, Onesimus responded, yes and no. And after describing the process and showing Mather the scar, said it was a common practice among his people. Other slaves would tell the minister similar stories. For Mather, the discovery of variolation as a remedy was both a medical and a spiritual answer to smallpox. He saw the cure as a providential gift that Africans had been given by a merciful God. In America, the primary methods of preventing smallpox outbreaks were quarantining incoming ships and isolating those who were ill. In mid-April 1721, two British ships coming into the Boston Harbor from the Caribbean passed by the quarantine station without stopping. Two slaves on board one of the ships already had smallpox, and several of the crew were incubating the disease. At the end of May, Cotton Mather wrote, The grievous calamity of smallpox has entered the town. There hadn't been an epidemic of smallpox in Boston for 18 years, and the 1721 outbreak would be the worst for the city in the 18th century. Harvard announced that its commencement would be private, so visitors would not risk spreading the illness. Dr. William Douglas said the disease had rendered this large and populous town of Boston a mere hospital. The funeral bells rang so often that the churchmen were ordered to only ring one bell at a time, and that only at designated hours. In Charleston, across the river, it was ordered not to ring more than three bells in one day for the burial of any person, lest it be discouragement to those who were ill with the smallpox. Mather had only a small amount of medical experience, but he saw the possibility of inoculation to be a miracle that needed to be implemented. On June 6, he sent the reports from the Royal Society to local physicians to encourage them to begin the practice of inoculation. When he received no response, he pressed Dr. Zabdiel Boylston and convinced him to test the practice. Boylston inoculated his youngest son as well as two of his slaves, and all three had recovered within a week. Encouraged, Boylston inoculated seven more people by July. Despite these early successes, the practice raised a horrid clamor among the people of Boston. Mather was not shy about saying that he had learned the practice from slaves, including Onesimus, and many people in Boston thought that advice from slaves was not advice at all, but an attempt to overthrow their masters. William Douglas said Mather was too eager to accept the advice of an army of half a dozen or half a score Africans. Boylston and Mather became the target of much invective. The city selectmen were convinced by other doctors who claimed that inoculation only spread the disease and ordered Boylston to stop administering the procedure. Rev. John Williams wrote that the practice violated the laws of medicine. Inoculation, he said, was not the treatment of a disease, but the creation of one, and that it made doctors into people who hurt instead of helped. The New England Current newspaper, helmed by Benjamin Franklin's brother James, came out against the practice, saying it spread rather than prevented smallpox. The fight became vicious enough that in November of 1721, someone threw a lighted grenade into Mather's house. Dr. Douglas was rare in the colonies because he held a medical degree from Europe and became one of the most vocal opponents. He claimed variolation killed more than it helped and that ministers were not qualified to offer medical advice, especially when they were trusting the testimony of slaves. Many slaves, to my knowledge, have assured their masters that they had the smallpox in their own country or elsewhere and have it now in Boston. Some Puritan ministers, such as Mather's father, Increase Mather, defended inoculation, believing that the will of God was to be discerned in nature as well as in revelation. But the practice challenged other Puritan beliefs. Puritans found meaning in affliction, and Reverend Williams openly wondered if inoculation was circumventing divine will and would only serve to provoke God more. He said there was no mention of inoculation in the Bible, which made the practice unlawful, and others worried that deliberately infecting their neighbors and risking their death violated the commandment, Thou shalt not kill. Mather stood firmly against these beliefs, saying, Whether a Christian may not employ this medicine and humbly give thanks to God's good providence in discovering of it is a miserable world. God had given man the resource to save themselves. It was up to them to use it. By early 1722, the epidemic had subsided, but the debate over inoculation continued long after. Of a population of 11,000, 6,000 cases of smallpox were recorded, 
and about 850 of those died, a death rate of about 14%. Of the almost 300 people Boylston had inoculated, only 6 had died, a rate of less than 2.5%. By the numbers, Onesimus' method had proven successful, offering the potential to save thousands of lives. It wasn't the success of the experiment in Boston that would convince Douglas, however. In 1721, Lady Montague would publicly have her daughter inoculated, and the English government tested the method on several prisoners. Shortly after, King George I's grandchildren were inoculated. Less than a decade after the Boston outbreak, two things changed to bring detractors like Douglas around to the practice. More of the public had personally seen the success of the procedure, and much more research was done and published by other authorities. By 1730, Douglas didn't just believe that inoculation worked, he encouraged it. One thing that did change from the 1721 trials was that those inoculated were quarantined for the duration of the illness, thus preventing the disease from spreading. Fifty years later, in 1775, George Washington ordered the Continental Army variolated to protect it. By the end of the Revolutionary War, the practice had gained widespread acceptance in the colonies. It is difficult to overstate the importance of variolation. Not only did the practice save millions of lives from smallpox, but it validated the idea of inoculation. In fact, until the 19th century when we developed several other vaccinations, inoculation meant literally only smallpox. The term vaccination didn't come about until 1790 when British physician Dr. Edward Jenner developed a vaccination for smallpox using less virulent cowpox. The term vaccination comes from the Latin word vacca, meaning cow. Variolation stopped being used pretty much in the 19th century as safer methods of preventing the disease were developed, but it continued to be used in very rural areas in places like Pakistan into the 1960s. By the 20th century, the World Health Organization headed an enormous effort to eliminate smallpox worldwide. And in 1980, WHO declared the disease eradicated. As for Onesimus, he eventually purchased greater freedoms from Cotton Mather. He married later in life and had a couple of children, although they died young. Apparently Onesimus never converted to Christianity, something which Cotton Mather found to be a frustrating personal failure. And while Cotton Mather is really much greater known for his role in promoting the idea of inoculation, the role played by Onesimus was not insignificant. His clear understanding of the procedure, his cogent explanation of how it worked, Cotton Mather had to go a long way towards convincing Mather that he was telling the truth. In 2016, Boston Magazine named Onesimus one of the best Bostonians of all time because of the role that he played in legitimizing the life-saving procedure. The world, it seems, enjoys a good Western. Western films were the most popular genre of film from pretty much the beginning of film all the way up through the 1960s, and Western fiction has been popular in a number of different media, from books and comic books to radio and television. And it's a worldwide phenomenon that is as popular, it seems, in Europe and Asia as it is in the country where the stories supposedly occur. But of course, Western fiction only rarely accurately represents life on the American frontier, and so the intersection between fiction and reality offers us good insights both into the consumer of Western fiction and the reality of Western life. And a good example of that is in one of the most popular of the fictional characters of the Wild West and the little-known lawmen who most resemble that character. And it is a story that deserves to be remembered. So return with us now to the thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger first rode into the hearts and minds of listeners courtesy Detroit area radio station WXYZ, with the title role voiced by actor George Seaton, who later won two Academy Awards for screenwriting, and said that he invented the famous catchphrase, Hi-O Silver, because he couldn't whistle. WXYZ aired nearly 3,000 radio episodes of the show featuring a Texas Ranger who fought outlaws, accompanied by his faithful Indian companion, Tonto. According to the story, the Lone Ranger was one of six Texas Rangers who were caught in an ambush by the despicable Butch Cavendish gang. Later, a friendly Indian happens upon the scene and finds that one of the Rangers has survived. Tonto buries the dead Rangers, but makes six grave markers to hide the fact that one survived. He then nurses the injured Ranger back to health. The Ranger is forced to wear a mask to conceal his identity since he was supposed to have died, as he fights for justice against Butch Cavendish and his gang. The show was a classic Western and was part popular partly because of the Ranger's strict moral code, which represented American values at the time and included phrases like, to have a friend, a man must be one, and all things change but truth, 
and that truth alone lives on forever. The Lone Ranger only used silver bullets because they reminded him that life is precious and, like the bullets, shouldn't be wasted. Along with the radio show, The Lone Ranger spurred two film serials in the 1930s, a popular television show that ran over 220 episodes between 1949 and 1957, two different cartoon series, a newspaper comic strip that ran for more than 30 years, dozens of adventure novels and comic books, a video game, hundreds of various toys, and seven feature films. And in one of the lesser-known connections, The Lone Ranger spawned a popular spin-off property where, according to the story in the original radio show, The Lone Ranger's young nephew, Dan, who appeared in both the radio show and the television show, has a son who eventually takes on again the role of masked crime fighter as the Green Hornet. But the popularity of The Lone Ranger begs an interesting question. Was there a real Lone Ranger? The answer is possibly. In 1915, novelist Zane Grey wrote a novel called The Lone Star Ranger, which itself was adapted for four different feature films. The character in the novel is fictionalized, but the novel was dedicated to a real Texas ranger named John Reynolds Hughes. While he was a rancher in Travis County, Texas, Hughes had tracked down a group that had stolen horses from his and other ranches. That drew the attention of the Texas Rangers, who recruited him. He served as a ranger for 28 years, the Texas Rangers' longest-serving member. Hughes was known as one of the most effective of the Texas Rangers, and notably, when another Texas Ranger captain was killed in an ambush, Hughes, one of the Rangers' best trackers, relentlessly pursued the gang that had committed the ambush, somewhat like the story told in The Lone Ranger. While Hughes had certainly inspired Zane Grey, who knew and respected Hughes, it's less clear whether he was an inspiration for The Lone Ranger, but he was certainly an example of a dedicated Texas Ranger, and, like the story, had doggedly tracked down outlaws who had killed other Texas Rangers in an ambush. But when talking about The Lone Ranger, there's another story as well, that of Lawman Bass Reeves, who was, according to one biographer, the closest real person to resemble The Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves had been born a slave in 1838, and as was common at the time, he had taken the last name of his owner as his own. Sometime in the early 1860s, he'd parted ways with that owner. Some stories say it's because he had a fight with his owner over a card game, and others say that he simply had heard that Lincoln was planning to free the slaves. But for whatever reason, Reeves escaped slavery and went to live in Indian territory, modern-day Oklahoma, living among Cherokee, Seminole, and Creek Indians, and learning both the territory and many of the people's languages. He became a crack shot with a pistol and a rifle. After the war, when the 13th Amendment passed and he no longer had to fear being returned to slavery, he moved to Arkansas, where he became a successful rancher and had 10 children. Indian Territory was notoriously lawless, and many outlaws fled there to escape justice. In 1875, President Grant appointed a new judge of the U.S. Court for the Western District of Arkansas with the goal of addressing lawlessness in the Indian Territory. The judge then appointed a former Confederate general as the new U.S. Marshal who then hired 200 deputy U.S. Marshals, some of whom were among the most famous lawmen of the West. Having heard of Reeves' knowledge of the Indian Territory and familiarity with its people, the new Marshal hired him as one of those deputies. Bass Reeves became the first black deputy U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi. He served for nearly 30 years and in that time brought in more than three thousand wanted outlaws. He survived numerous gunfights, and despite having both his belt and his hat shot off in different gunfights, he never himself took a bullet. He was one of the most feared and respected lawmen of the Indian Territory. He was known for dressing fastidiously and for wearing two Colt pistols with the butts faced forward for a quick draw. As was common for many Americans of the time, and certainly former slaves, he had never received a formal education and so never learned to read and write. Before he went on patrols, which could take months at a time, he would have someone read the outstanding warrants to him, which he could recite from memory. At first, Reeves might seem nothing like the Lone Ranger. He wasn't even a Texas Ranger and was never shot, more or less nursed back to health by a faithful Indian companion. But deputies in the Indian Territory would often travel only accompanied by a posse member, who would be a Native American. Although he was most known for riding a red stallion with a white blaze that highly resembled Tonto's horse Scout from the Lone Ranger television series, he was also known to ride a white horse. And while he did not wear a mask, he was known to use disguises when capturing outlaws. It is not hard to see how this dedicated lawman, traveling alone with his Indian companion, catching the bad guys, could be seen as, as one biographer described him, the closest real person to resemble the Lone Ranger. 
In the end, there's no real evidence that either Bass Reeves or John Ronald Hughes inspired the fictional character of the Lone Ranger. The creators of the character actually didn't mention any real lawmen at all. They said the Lone Ranger was inspired by Robin Hood and the actor Tom Mix. But both Reeves and Hughes bore some striking resemblance to the legendary Masked Ranger, and they show us that the, the, the vision of a lone lawman dispensing justice on the wild frontier is not merely a fabrication of the entertainment industry. It is interesting that both Reeves and Hughes had some similar backgrounds. Both as young men had spent substantial time in Indian Territory, where they developed the skills that would serve them later as lawmen. Both had been successful ranchers, which provided them with a vested interest in protecting the people of the frontier from lawlessness. And both had long and distinguished careers as lawmen, part of that special breed of people who bridged the gap between the Wild West and the modern world. And both were most certainly heroes, even though neither one is nearly as well known as the legendary Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves died of kidney disease in 1910 at the age of 71, and John Reynolds Hughes, who was in ill health and depressed over the fact that all his old friends had died, tragically took his own life in 1947. He was 92. But Bass Reeves is a great example of one of the things that Hollywood has largely gotten wrong over the years. To watch the golden age of American westerns, you might have guessed that the frontier was settled only by white cowboys. In fact, an estimated 20 to 25 percent of the western cowboys were black, where the independence of the range offered a relative equality, even though they still faced discrimination and were often given the least favorable tasks. It is those true stories of the West that deserve to be remembered. There's a good chance if you've heard of James Cleveland Jesse Owens, the astounding athlete who won four gold medals at the 1936 Olympic Games and was described in his obituary in the New York Times as perhaps the greatest and most famous athlete in track and field history. You may also well have heard of Jack Roosevelt Jackie Robinson, who in 1947 became the first African-American baseball player to play in Major League Baseball in the modern era, thus breaking the so-called color barrier. But you are far less likely to have heard of Matthew McKenzie Mack Robinson, who finished second to Jesse Owens in the 200 meters in the 1936 Olympics and was the older brother of Jackie Robinson. Mack Robinson largely missed the accolades, but his story deserves to be remembered. Mack and Jackie were both born in Georgia, the sons of sharecroppers. Mack, born in 1914, was the third of five children. Jackie, born four years later, was the youngest. Their father left them after Jackie was born, and in 1920 their mother moved them to Pasadena, California, where she worked odd jobs to keep the family afloat. But Mack and Jackie Robinson, because of their athletic ability, had the opportunity to attend college. Mack attended what was then called Pasadena Junior College, now Pasadena City College, where he was a track standout. He wanted to try out for the U.S. Olympic team, but the college had no money to send him, so some local businessmen had to raise the money to buy him a train ticket to New York, where the trials were held at Randall's Island Stadium on July 11th and 12th. He couldn't afford new shoes, and so ran in the worn-out shoes he used in junior college, but still qualified for the Olympics in the 200 meters. 0.2 seconds behind Ohio State University's star sprinter, Jesse Owens. Robinson was one of 10 black men to qualify for the 1936 Olympics for the United States, matching all other previous Olympics combined. In the final at the 1936 Olympics, still wearing his worn out shoes, Mack beat the previous Olympic record with a time of 21.1 seconds, but still got the silver, 0.4 seconds behind Jesse Owens' record finish. Robinson expressed no disappointment. He said, it's not too bad to be second best in the world at what you're doing, no matter what it is. It means that only one other person in the world was better than you. That makes you better than an awful lot of people. Still, Robinson understood that he had achieved what he had without the benefit of proper shoes or a coach, whereas Owens had been coached by legendary Ohio State coach Larry Snyder. Mac's daughter, Kathy Robinson Young, recalled, Daddy always thought that if he had better shoes or some decent coaching, he could have beaten Jesse, or at least made it even closer than it was. But a silver medal didn't guarantee fame. He said upon returning home, If anybody in Pasadena was proud of me, other than my family and close friends, they never showed it. I was totally ignored. The only time I was noticed was when someone asked me during assembly at school if I'd race against a horse. But he continued to excel. He returned to Pasadena Junior College for the 1936-37 school year and set then national junior college records in the 100 and 220-yard sprints and the broad jump, 
where his record of 25 feet, 5.5 inches, was beaten the following year by his younger brother, Jackie. And the Olympics had earned him an opportunity. At the games, he met and befriended Bill Hayward, the track and field coach for the University of Oregon. Mack attended the university for the 1938-39 school year, winning an NCAA championship for the team in the 220-yard dash. After graduating from Oregon with a degree in physical education, Robinson had difficulty finding work and ended up taking a municipal job with the city of Pasadena, pushing a broom. He recalled that when it was cold, sometimes he would wear his Olympic jacket. In this, his plight was not unique. Jesse Owens, who had run 0.4 seconds faster, also took a number of menial jobs in his life, including gas station attendant, playground, janitor, and manager of a dry cleaning firm. He once remarked, I had four gold medals, but you can't eat four gold medals. Even Mac's menial job with a broom turned out not to be safe. In 1941, the city was forced by the California District Court to desegregate its public swimming pools, in retaliation, the city fired all its black municipal employees, including Mac Robinson. The treatment of his older brother was said to be part of what motivated Jackie Robinson, who not only broke the Major League color barrier, but was a Major League Baseball Rookie of the Year, National League MVP, won a World Championship with the Dodgers in 1955, and in 1962 was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame on the first ballot. Mac Robinson's silver medal run in 1936 was recognized again in 1984, when he was selected as part of a group that carried a giant Olympic flag into the opening ceremony of the 1984 Olympics at the Los Angeles Coliseum. His daughter, Kathy Robinson Young, said it was his greatest moment. His native city finally recognized him when, in 1997, they dedicated the Pasadena Robinson Memorial, installed across from City Hall. The memorial includes a nine-foot-tall bust of he and Jackie. The Pasadena City College Stadium is named Robinson Stadium after he and his brother, and a Pasadena post office is named in his honor. While he was not as well known as his brother or the man who ran four seconds faster, he left behind an extraordinary legacy of good works. Mac Robinson, who among other jobs was an usher at Dodger Stadium, found his calling working as a truant officer for John Muir High School in Pasadena and an advocate against street crime. He was acutely aware of how his athletic success could be used as a teaching tool to change the world. As the plaque under his memorial reads, Athletes should recognize that once they establish themselves, people will attempt to pattern their lives after their sports heroes. Mac Robinson passed away in March of 2000 at the age of 85, leaving behind at the time of his death six children, 25 grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. There's been a lot said and written about black leaders in the era of the U.S. Civil War and Reconstruction, people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, but there were many more who struggled for their people's freedom whose names are relatively unknown. And among those is Abraham Galloway, an escaped slave who risked his life, his freedom, repeatedly as a Union spy, materially impacted the war, and served tirelessly throughout his lifetime to realize the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. His story deserves to be remembered. Abraham H. Galloway was born in the tiny town of Smithville, North Carolina in 1837 to 17-year-old slave Hester Hankins and John Wesley Galloway, a free white man and son of a planter. Though it was rare for white men to recognize their children by slaves, Abraham said that his father recognized me as his son and protected me as far as he was allowed to do so. Abraham was owned by Marsden Hankins, who was only seven years his senior. He was trained as a brick mason from the age of 10. Nearby Wilmington was one of the busiest ports in the South during the cotton boom in the first half of the 19th century. The boom gave Abraham plenty of work, which he was free to seek on his own while Marsden worked his own trade. Galloway was expected to contribute $180 to the household annually, but otherwise enjoyed a fair amount of freedom of his time. He spoke with other blacks and was able to stay appraised of national news. As Galloway would later put it, in 1857, he and a friend decided that liberty was worth dying for, and it was their duty to strike for freedom, even if it should cost them their lives. At the same time, immigrants also threatened Galloway's ability to make the $180 his master expected, and Galloway may have feared that he would be sold. Galloway and his friend risked much to find a captain who would hide them among his cargo, and neither spoke much about who they found or how they got aboard his boat in secret. 
They hid among naval stores, barrels of tar, rosin, and turpentine, but danger remained. Authorities would fumigate ship holds with burning turpentine dross to flush out hiding slaves. The fumes had an effect like tear gas and could even be lethal. The escapees planned to cover themselves with a shroud and held pig bladders full of water to moisten their faces if the gas started pouring down. Fortunately, they didn't have to test their homemade solution. The boat wasn't fumigated. On the trip, they grew sick from leaking turpentine fumes in the hold, but when they disembarked in Philadelphia, they were free. They received assistance from prominent abolitionists in the Underground Railroad who helped them reach Canada out of the range of the Fugitive Slave Act. Before he left, Galloway posed for a photo, an etching of which is the only confirmed surviving image of him. They traveled to Kingston, Ontario, just across the border from New York. Galloway wouldn't stay in Canada long. According to his friend, publisher Robert Hamilton, he wandered all over this country and Canada. In 1860, he even spent 15 weeks in Haiti, where a colony was been organized for escaped slaves. Galloway returned to the U.S. on April 1st, 1861, 11 days before the attack on Fort Sumter. He immediately went south, as one colleague described it, to incite insurrections. Actually, on the recommendation of influential Boston industrialist George Stearns, 24-year-old Galloway had been recruited as a spy. Galloway was determined to take action for his brothers in slavery, and some union leaders realized that former slaves would make good spies. They knew how to blend in in the South, were used to hiding and traveling in secret, and wouldn't betray the Union for a bribe. As a Union colonel later said, they had been spies all their lives. Galloway joined General Benjamin Butler, who had been put in charge of Fortress Monroe in Hampton, Virginia, one of the few remaining Union strongholds in Confederate territory. As official intelligence gathering channels did not exist yet, Galloway reported directly to Butler and was said to possess his fullest confidence. Much of what he did is lost to history, but he frequently went behind enemy lines and was known to be highly effective. Fortress Monroe was quickly inundated with escaping slaves, and while he had no official orders, Butler took them under his protection as contraband of war, utilizing what intelligence they brought and providing shelter and food. Galloway helped organize an enormous slave spy network, which even had a member in the Confederate White House in Richmond. Among the many intelligence missions Galloway participated in was to scout for landings for an invasion of North Carolina, accomplished by Ambrose Burnside in the winter of 1861, which secured much of the coastline for the duration of the war. This was the land where Galloway had been born and lived most of his life, and he and other slaves who acted as pilots to assist Union forces to navigate the waterways were integral in its capture. Galloway next joined Butler when he was tasked with taking New Orleans, which they did in short order. Galloway did scouting work and determined that Vicksburg was too heavily defended for Butler to take. They tried to bypass Vicksburg by digging a canal, and Brigadier General Thomas Williams confiscated more than a thousand slaves to do the work. Those slaves, and apparently a captured Galloway, were abandoned when the Union gave up on the plan. How Galloway was captured or what happened next isn't clear. He never told anyone the full story or how he escaped and reappeared on the North Carolina coast, a journey of nearly a thousand miles. Galloway lost some faith in the Union from this episode, and once in North Carolina turned his attention to helping the escaped slaves who had clustered on the coast. The former slaves played pivotal military roles in the theater. One colonel said, in all our expeditions, we have depended upon Negroes for our gods, for without them, we could not have moved with any safety. Galloway seemed, maybe unofficially, to be in charge of these men. His work in the contraband communities also gave birth to a new side of himself, the political organizer. He gained a reputation for a wry sense of humor, was said to laugh well and often. Northern journalists described him as fearless and audacious. He was also instrumental in getting former slaves to enlist with the Union Army. In May of 1863, Edward Kinsley, an abolitionist and wool merchant, arrived with a mission given by Lincoln to assess the possibility of recruiting former slaves. But to his surprise, he found no one that was interested. When asked why, they directed him to Galloway. By befriending Marianne Starkey, who ran a boarding house that was a primary contact between black leaders and Union command, he was eventually introduced to Galloway and other black leaders in the dead of night in Starkey's attic. Galloway said he didn't trust the Union, disliked the cavalier way that Union leaders enlisted blacks for labor, among other mistreatment. He had three demands. That black soldiers be paid as much as white ones, that the soldiers' families would be cared for, and most importantly, that the Union army compel the Confederacy to treat black soldiers as prisoners of war and not escape slaves or traitors. The last demand was the hardest, because Kinsley knew he could not keep that promise. Still, eventually he agreed to it, and the black leaders had Kinsley swear an oath to it, while holding revolvers against his head. A few days later, Kinsley had his recruits, hundreds of former slaves, 
of Herculean proportion. More than 5,000 would eventually enlist from around New Bern, and 186,000 blacks would eventually serve, around half of them former slaves. Galloway spent the summer of 1863 as a recruiting emissary for the cause, reaching out to his many contacts and freedmen camps inside rebel territory. Galloway did one more mission as a Union spy for his old friend, General Butler. Butler had heard rumors that the POW camp at Point Lookout, Maryland held many Confederates with Union sympathies, who could be convinced to enlist in exchange for their release. The camp was a miserable place, overcrowded and filled with desperate men fighting over meager supplies. Certainly most of the prisoners would be unhappy to find a black man in their midst. Though we don't know the content of Galloway's reports, by March of 1864, the first regiment of galvanized Yankees was sent to the Dakota frontier. Even as the war entered a bloody stalemate, Galloway was confident that the South would lose and that he needed to start looking towards the future. In 1864, he decided to move his efforts from the cartridge box to the ballot box. To that end, on April 29, 1864, Abraham Galloway and five others formed the first delegation of Southern black leaders to meet the President of the United States. From the start, the delegation was shocked at their good treatment. They were allowed in the front door, something of heard of in the South where blacks were expected to come around the back. Lincoln was said to have treated the delegation with respect and dignity. As Frederick Douglass had said, Lincoln was the first great man I talked with in the United States freely, who in no single instance reminded me of the difference of color. The petitioners sought a promise that Lincoln would finish the noble work you have begun and grant unto your petitioners the greatest of privileges to exercise the right of suffrage. Galloway knew that blacks, especially in the South, would struggle after the war and that voting rights were one of the few ways that he would be able to fight back. Lincoln expressed his support, but did not promise the petitioners anything. Galloway's speeches across the North that year were hopeful, and he was said to make those laugh who had never laughed before. Still, Galloway was reminded of the lesser place blacks still held. Repeated massacres of black troops at Fort Pillow, Fort Wagner, Milliken's Bend, and Suffolk, Virginia, and the reticence of Northern leaders to discourage them reminded him that even then the North saw black soldiers as less valuable than white ones. When Lincoln was killed, he joined the board for the National Lincoln Monument. Galloway was selected as one of a handful of Southern delegates who attended the National Convention of Colored Men in October 1864. It was the first national meeting of black leaders, and it created the first national civil rights group, the National Equal Rights League. Galloway was named one of the 16 vice presidents of the League. His speaking tour afterwards can be characterized by a single line. I am God's free man, and I feel I am ready to do all I can to lift up my own oppressed brethren. He helped to found the first state chapter of the National Equal Rights League in North Carolina. Auxiliary chapters were founded all over the coast. He was elected president of the League in New Bern, where Moorhead City dubbed itself the Abraham H. Galloway Equal Rights League. Galloway demanded public schooling for black children, in addition to voting rights, so as to be an educated people and an intelligent people. If the Negro knows how to use the cartridge box, he said, he knows how to use the ballot box. He even said he was willing to agree to literacy tests for voting if they were applied equally to blacks and whites. And I tell you that this, if this is done, one half the white people of North Carolina will be debarred from voting. Violence was endemic between blacks and whites in the first days after the Confederacy collapsed. North Carolina held a constitutional convention without inviting any blacks to reinstate the antebellum order, while at the same time a freed people's convention was held across town, where Galloway and others asked for citizenship, public schooling, and equal treatment under the law. Galloway was called perhaps the most remarkable person among the delegates. At home, Galloway faced the threat of regulators, white militias, and soon the Ku Klux Klan. At least once, Galloway was forced to flee for his life. There is no protection for the colored people, he said. Our lives are always in danger. In 1867, the Republican Congress passed the Reconstruction Acts, which forced southern states to pass constitutions that guaranteed universal male suffrage. Galloway seized this opportunity and supported the Republican cause wholeheartedly. I stand here as a representative of the Republican Party, neither Republican black man or Republican white man, but the Republican Party. Galloway served as a delegate to the 1868 North Carolina Constitutional Convention, even though the press derided it as a kangaroo convention that would write a guerrilla constitution. Afterwards, he was put up for the state senate in the first race where blacks were allowed to hold statewide office. Threatened whites engaged in mass voter intimidation, when people were writing that the only way to defeat growing black political power was the stern and bloody experiences of the battlefield. For fear of his safety, Galloway constantly carried a revolver. While giving a speech, he was attacked by a man with a bowie knife, and he barely escaped a lynch mob. He was also chosen as the first black presidential elector in North Carolina history. 
In the Senate, he constantly challenged white politicians, refusing to obey traditional rules of deference. One paper called him the pugilistic Indian senator, in reference to his mixed blood, while another called him the colored Napoleon. He was always ready for a fight, and even threatened duels with senators who could not give him respect. If white people don't like their legislation, he said, they can leave. He faced constant racism, both in his personal life and in legislation, which declared that blacks were naturally inferior to whites. When a bill raising train ticket taxes was announced, he accused it of trying to price out black citizens, and rightly added, pass this bill, and you encourage horse stealing. When a colleague said the KKK was necessary to assure order and curb black criminality, Galloway shouted the man down. How could he justify the deeds and outrages of this miserable and contemptible organization? He was a major political supporter of labor and women's rights during his tenure. He twice proposed bills to amend the state constitution to extend suffrage to women. Tragically, at the height of his political career, shortly after having been re-elected to the North Carolina State Senate, Abraham Galloway died suddenly on September 1st, 1870, of a fever and jaundice. Some 6,000 people attended his funeral. One newspaper said that it was possibly the largest funeral in the state's history. He had survived so many attempts on his life, only to die of natural causes at just the age of 33. Shortly after his death, conservative Southerners resurged in what was called the Redemption to overthrow the Reconstruction era. In his time, Abraham Galloway was one of the most dynamic and popular of the Southern black leaders. He believed he had a cause that was larger than his own life, but he never learned to read and write, and so left behind very little to describe his own thoughts. And black codes and Jim Crow laws conspired to bury his memory. He was really only rediscovered in 2012 when a biography about him was written and a marker was erected near his hometown of Wilmington. The year before his death, he gave a speech that perhaps best described his life work. He said, I care not about the living present, but there must be a deep foundation laid for the coming generation. America is very excited right now about a new movie that's out that stars a black superhero. And of course, that's notable because black lead roles are really fairly uncommon in Hollywood movies and black superhero roles even more rare. And with no disrespect whatsoever to that film, what I would say as the history guy is that if you wanted to make a film about a black superhero, you should have made a film about Robert Smalls, a man whose heroism throughout his life was so amazing that he deserved the title superhero if anyone ever did. And his story deserves to be remembered. Robert Smalls was born into slavery in 1839 in Beaufort, South Carolina. His mother was a slave and his father is not known, although it may well have been his owner, Henry McKee. When Robert was just 12 years old, his owner, McKee, started running him out as a day laborer, with, of course, McKee keeping the money. As Robert was interested in the sea, he started taking most of his work down by the Charleston docks, first as a stevedore, unloading boats or doing dock work, but eventually on the boats themselves as a sailor, a fisherman, a, a sailmaker, whatever would take him out to sea. And eventually, he became so familiar with the coastline of South Carolina that he became a skilled boat pilot, even though a black man in that era would not have been called a pilot. He was probably called a, a wheel man. In 1856, he married a fellow slave, a, a hotel maid named Hannah Smith, who had two daughters of her own, and then together they had two more children, a daughter and a son, who died at a young age. They were doing well enough that they were allowed to live in a home separate from their owners, but of course most of their pay still went to their owners. The Civil War started literally just out front Robert's door at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. The Confederacy recognized Robert's skill and pressed him into service as the wheelman aboard the CSS Planter, a sidewheel steamer that had been converted into an armed dispatch boat. The planter delivered dispatches, troops, and supplies, as well as laid mines, then called torpedoes, to protect Charleston Harbor. Robert was a trusted member of the crew, and his piloting skills were valuable, given his knowledge and experience with the coast. But like any human who is treated as property, Robert really yearned for freedom, and that was particularly true then because Hannah's master had become abusive, and he was afraid that that master was going to sell Hannah away. He wanted to buy Hannah's freedom, but he didn't have nearly enough money, and so they had to escape. And in May of 1862, he saw his opportunity to do that. Smalls had noticed that the Confederate officers made a habit of leaving the ship at night, so he and the other eight slaves aboard hatched a plan. 
On May 12, 1862, the planter was docked in Charleston, carrying a load of four cannon that were intended to add to the city's defenses. When, in the evening, the officers left the ship, Smalls and the crew took the boat, met their families at a prearranged spot in the harbor, and fled to the Union blockade. This was no simple feat. Had they been caught, they would have all certainly been executed. The harbor was well defended, with five Confederate harbor forts, each capable of destroying the boat. But Smalls knew all the proper signals, and even impersonated the captain standing at the front of the boat. Once free of the harbor, they lowered the Confederate flag and put up a white sheet, hoping the ships of the Union blockade would see it. Yet they were still nearly fired upon by the Federal blockade fleet. As the captain of the armed clipper, USS Onward, seeing the Confederate gunboat, ordered the guns to ready, a crewman with binoculars saw Smalls and his compatriots waving frantically from the deck. Once the captain of the Onward boarded the planter, Smalls reportedly asked him if they had a Union flag that the ship could fly. Incredibly, Small's audacious plan had not only allowed him to steal a Confederate warship from a well-defended harbor and deliver it to the Union, but also to deliver nine families from slavery. No superhero ever accomplished more. Small's became a hero in the Union, but the Confederacy put a $4,000 bounty on his head. His knowledge of the Charleston Harbor and defenses was invaluable to the Union, and he ended up serving as a pilot aboard a number of Union warships, including the now USS Planter. Having planted mines for the Confederacy, now he helped the Union to disarm them. An 1883 naval report noted that he participated in 17 Civil War battles and engagements, including serving as a pilot aboard the ironclad USS Keokuk during the disastrous attack on Charleston, April 7th of 1863, where the ship was savaged by Fort Sumter's guns. The heavily damaged ship was able to withdraw under her own power, due in large part to Small's considerable piloting skills. In December of 1863, he was back aboard USS Planter when the steamer got caught in a crossfire between Union and Confederate troops near Folly Island. The captain of the boat, James Nickerson, panicked and ordered the boat to surrender. Smalls refused, knowing that he and the other black sailors would face execution if they were captured. He took command and was able to navigate the boat outside the Confederate guns. For his heroism, he was made captain of the planter, the first black man to command a United States ship. During the war, he engaged in other heroics as well. He was instrumental in convincing Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to allow the recruitment of black troops into the Union Army, and helped to recruit former slaves for the 1st Volunteer South Carolina Regiment, one of the first black regiments. He supported efforts to raise money to educate former slaves, and he himself achieved literacy. He was voted an unofficial delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1864. Also that year, when he was forced to give up his seat to a white passenger on a Philadelphia streetcar, he left the car rather than sit in the open overflow platform. That small act of rebellion helped to motivate the state of Pennsylvania to integrate public transportation in 1867. In Robert Smalls, whose heroics to this point I think already qualify him for superhero status, did not end his heroics with the end of the war. Following the Civil War, the South went through a period that was called Radical Reconstruction. Spurred by the 14th and 15th Amendments, which guaranteed the right of black Americans to vote, black Americans were able to participate in the American political process for the first time. So-called Union Leagues were created, essentially as a branch of the Republican Party, and encouraged political activism on the part of black citizens. This facilitated a period of Republican domination of Southern politics. Robert Smalls was part of this. He was a delegate to the 1868 South Carolina Constitutional Convention. He was elected to the State House of Representatives and then to the State Senate, and in 1874 was elected to the United States House of Representatives. But this was a brutal era in U.S. politics, where anti-Reconstructionists frequently used violence and intimidation, often through shadow organizations of the Democrats, such as the Ku Klux Klan and the South Carolina Red Shirts. 35 African-American officials were murdered by such organizations during the period of Reconstruction. Small's life was threatened by a group of armed red shirts at a political rally in 1876. Over his long political career, he had to endure threats of violence, false and trumped-up charges, and open intimidation of voters. One contemporary observer noted in her diary, Political times are simply frightful. Men are shot at, hounded down, trapped and held till certain meetings are over, and intimidated in every possible way. Eventually, Democrats won back the South and enacted numerous constitutional and legal changes designed to disenfranchise the black vote. Robert Smalls conducted his long political career during an era where serving meant risking his life, and the mere act of a black man voting was an act of heroism in the face of violence. 
10 minutes is far too short a time to go over all the causes and crusades of Robert Smalls. The man who escaped slavery by audaciously stealing a Confederate warship underneath their very noses never backed down in the face of adversity. The young man who had to flee slavery because he could not afford to purchase his wife's freedom after the war used the money given to him by the Union as a prize for capturing the CSS planter to purchase his former owner's home. The young man who was central to the Union decision to incorporate black troops into the Union Army eventually was made a major general in the South Carolina militia. In 2004, when the U.S. Army named a massive Besson-class logistic support vehicle the USAV Major General Robert Smalls, it became the first U.S. Army vessel to be named after an African American. Through it all, he faced threats of violence and discrimination. In the end, he even had to fight for his pension. It turns out that the first black captain of United States ship was because of his race, never officially commissioned. Robert Small served throughout the Civil War 17 engagements, technically, as a civilian. Robert Smalls died of diabetes in 1915 at the age of 75. On his monument is a quotation from a statement he made to the South Carolina legislature in 1895. My race needs no special defense. Their history in this country proves them to be the equal of any man anywhere. All they need is an equal chance in the battle of life. The world is currently remembering the 100th anniversary of the war to end all wars. More than 16 million people died in the First World War fought between July of 1914 and November of 1918. And there are many forgotten stories of that war that deserve to be remembered. But one of the more interesting one is the little known fact that one of the greatest heroes of the French army in the First World War was in fact an American. And while he was a great hero in France, he was barely acknowledged in the United States. And that's too bad, because not only is his a story worth remembering, but it's a story from which America could certainly learn. And so today we are going to remember the extraordinary story of Eugene Jacques Boulard, the Black Swallow of Death. Eugene Bullard was born in 1895 in Columbus, Georgia, the son of William Bullard, who had come from the French island of Martinique and spoke French in his home. The family history was interesting. They had been slaves in the French colony of Haiti and had been moved from Haiti to Martinique to avoid the slave rebellion in Haiti. Eventually, his family had escaped and moved to the United States, where they found refuge with the Creek Indians. Ballard's mother was a Creek Indian, although she died while he was young. At the age of 12, he stowed away on a German freighter bound for Scotland. He was trying to escape racial hatred in the United States, where he had seen his father nearly lynched. His goal was to move to France, where his father had told him that people were accepted regardless of the color of their skin. In Scotland, he became a successful boxer and eventually earned enough money to fulfill his dream and move to Paris. When the Great War came to France, he was too young to enlist, but on his 19th birthday, he signed up with other Americans to join the famed French Foreign Legion. With the French Foreign Legion, he saw some of the most terrible fighting of that terrible war, including the horrible Battle of the Somme and the bloody Champagne Offensive. What was really surprising at the time was that he survived. In some of these battles, his regiment took as much as 80% losses. By the end of 1915, the losses couldn't be replaced and his regiment was dissolved, but the surviving volunteers were allowed to join French Metropolitan Army units, and so Ballard chose to join the 170th Infantry, one of the most elite units of the French Army. The unit symbol was a swallow, and they were known as Le Hirondelle de la Mort, the Swallows of Death. And as the only black man in the regiment, he therefore got his famous nickname, the Black Swallow of Death. With the 170th, he saw a new definition of war as he was taken to the Battle of Verdun. A veteran of some of the worst fighting in history, he said of Verdun, no one has 
ever seen anything like Verdun, not ever before, nor ever since. In March of 1916, he took a terrible wound at Verdun, so terrible that they thought he might never walk again. He was awarded two of the highest military honors in the French army, the Croix de Guerre and the Medal Militaire. He was a bona fide war hero. You might think that as a veteran of the Somme and Verdun and having won two of the highest awards in French history and having taken a grievous wound that Boulard had done his bit for the war, especially considering that he wasn't even a French citizen, but he was not the sort of person to give up. No longer fit for the infantry, he signed up for the French Flying Corps and on May 5th, 1917, he earned his wings. He was the first known black fighter pilot in the world, and one of only two known in the First World War. He flew with over 200 other American volunteers in the famed Lafayette Flying Corps and flew over 20 combat missions, but then he would again see the flaws in the country of his birth. While he was always accepted in the French military, when America entered the war, he with other Lafayette pilots tried to join the American Flying Corps. The other pilots were accepted, but Boulard was not, because it seemed America would not stomach a black pilot. Later he got into an altercation with a French officer and was booted from the French Flying Corps back to the 170th Regiment, where he finished the war. When he finished, he was one of France's most decorated warriors, a national hero, and yet still virtually unknown in the United States. After the war, he worked in a famous French nightclub and eventually started one of his own called the Escadrille. He became friends with some of the most famous people of his day, Josephine Baker, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong. He married a countess and they had two daughters, although that eventually ended in divorce. It was a good time, but in 1940, war again came to France. As he was fluent in both French and German, he would gather intelligence for the French in his nightclub from the German people that would still patronize his nightclub. But as the German army approached Paris, he escaped with his daughter south to Orleans and joined the French 41st Regiment. There, in a brave attack where every other member of his unit was killed and he was grievously wounded, his friends realized that if he was captured by the Gestapo, they would kill him. And so they managed to smuggle he and his daughters through neutral Spain back to the United States. Unlike France, in the United States he wasn't famous and his wound was serious and took a long time to recover. It was difficult to find work, but eventually he found employment as an elevator operator in New York's Rockefeller Center. Still unknown and unacknowledged in the United States, he was still a great hero in France, and in 1959 his service in two wars was recognized when France made him a Knight of the Legion of Honor, the highest award for service to the country of France. It was only then that he received some notice in the United States, being interviewed on NBC's Today Show. He wore his uniform as an elevator operator because, of course, he operated the elevator in the same building in which the Today Show was filmed. When he passed away in 1961, he was buried under the tricolor flag with French full military honors by the Federation of French War Officers. What is maybe most amazing about Eugene Ballard is that he never stopped loving the United States. This is a country that he had to flee for fear for his life because of racial hatred. A country that had denied him the right to fight on their behalf. And yet in 1959, when he was awarded the Legion of Honor, he said, America is my mother, and I love my mother. But as far as France is concerned, she is my mistress, and you love your mistress more than you love your mother, but in a different way. America finally showed him a little of that love back when, in 1994, they posthumously made him a lieutenant in the United States Air Force, acknowledging that they had erred when they had denied him that right 77 years earlier. That honor came 33 years after his death, a late acknowledgement from the country of his birth and the country that he never stopped loving.